Yeah, yeah, what's good? We are here at the homestead on a shitter teaching remotely. <laughs> I don't know, yo, but uh, welcome to week two. We're going to talk about satire parody in the carnival esque. I uh, hope you marked your calendars or whatever for our crappy happy hour. Mondays at five o'clock. This is, yo, this is mad informal. Just drop in, holla. You know, we can share a beverage, share recipes, share some jokes, share some music, art, whatever, uh, talk about this fucked up world, uh, whatever you want to do. But I'm here on my toilet at the farm. My neighbors who are far away probably think I'm fucking nuts, but I am. So anyways, um, yeah, so we're going to talk about satire and parody in the carnival-esque, very fun stuff. Um, last class, towards the end of last class, I talked about Peter Berger's uh, four characteristics or criteria of satire, and you want to know what these are. So a, a fantasy that's usually grotesque, so some sort of disgusting, uh, bizarre fantasy. It's always in a fantasy world. There's a moral point, like they're trying to make a point, a moral point. There's a moral compass, believe it or not, in all the fucked up shit you see in South Park. It's there. Um, there's always going to be an object that's attacked or a subject a person, there's something that's going to be attacked um, in a good satire. And there's always going to be an edu educational outcome. There's always like some purpose of edification that you'll have in an episode, okay? And satires often use, guess what? Parody. So South Park is like a prime example of where mimicking, mocking, authority, celebrities as authority, etc., um, you know, becomes a part of the satire. To make their larger social statement, they need to make these, uh, these parodies. So the example I used was of Mama June and Honey Boo Boo, right, and how, you know, there's this TV show, reality TV show, that shows them as these sort of grotesque, um, you know, morally corrupt, maybe pimping out their daughter, um, you know, uh, in order to make money, uh, you know, and that's part of the parody and they make fun of them and that's part of actually the satire in and of itself. But the main satire is the critique of us as consumers of this, which perpetuates the production of this type of, you know, baseless content um, by the media industries. Um, but it's because of us, because we consume it, you know, it's supply and demand. So that's the point that, that, they're, that they're making in that satire, but they use the parody of Honey Boo Boo, Mama June, um, to, to, to make that, you know, that sort of moral standpoint. Um, they attack them, you know, pretty heavily, and it's pretty fantastical where, <laughs> you know, throughout the episode, if, you, if you've seen it, okay? So some differences between parody and satire. This is actually really comf comfy, comfy toilet. Oh, there's my wife sonking at me. She's probably like, what the fuck are you doing? Um, <laughs> anyways, uh, the difference between parody and satire, if you split the screen in half, right, um, we can look at, you know, uh, parody first. Parody is almost always entirely going to have humor. There's always, it's always going to be at least trying to be funny. You may not actually think it's funny, but it's trying to be funny. Someone's being mimicked, in, or something, right? A concept, a person, um, a text, so a movie, or, or, or um, you know, a TV show, or a book, or something like that. And it relies on our familiarity with the object or subject of attack to, for the parody to have its effect. Like, if we don't know that they're making fun of Mickey Mouse, like, which, how do you not fucking know that? But they do, if we don't know that, like, then the parody doesn't really do what it's supposed to do, okay? This is usually just a pure mock or mimic. Like, it's just literally to, like, take these people uh, or these texts off of their, you know, off of their high point, to take them off of, off, off of their pedestal, so, so to speak. And the outcome, really, for us, like, or the, you know, what the author wants for us is laughter, they want us to laugh, okay? That, that's what parody is, you know, for the, for the most part, okay? Satire also is humor. There's often humor, but it's, many times it's a little bit more subtle than the parody, right? We laugh outright at the parody. The, the, the satire, we, it's, it's, it, it, it sort of um, is cultivated in us, and it takes a longer time for it to cultivate. Okay? There's no direct mocking or mimicking in a satire, and that's the point, is that it's an indirect 
um, critique and it uses parody often but it uses all these different elements to make this larger critique so you may not recognize when you watch an episode of South Park what the larger satire is maybe you only get the parody part right and you don't actually understand the larger um, object of or subject of social critique um, there's often like a mocking of many times a mocking but there's you know there's a social or socio-political sort of um, contestation here trying to undermine authority of society of dominant society of, of politics and what's supposed to happen through this humor this more subtle humor is critical thought it's supposed to engage us and the as the audience um, you know in, in a realm of rethinking the world um, and whereas parody doesn't do that it just makes us laugh right um, through the humor. This humor and satire often is intended to make us rethink, you know, social structures and hierarchies and then often to challenge them. Okay. Uh, parody then, if we flip to the next, the next slide, is often, you know, relies on borrowing. You have to borrow enough of the object or subject of critique for the audience to get what or who you're critiquing. That's a very important part. And often this relies on intertextuality or a dialogic nature, which we'll talk about in the next class, but basically this idea that we understand and we can connect the parody to these prior texts, that, we, that we're televisually literate enough to where we can understand um, you know, what they're referencing. Okay? The interesting thing though, if we look at satire a little bit more, and one of the, the, the great examples that we, uh, that we use is Gulliver's Travel, which is a commentary on you know, uh, rulership, uh, it's a commentary on pol politics, it's John Sw Jonathan Swift's uh, commentary on misogyny, uh, all that stuff. But um, you know, often you know, uh, satire you know, does, you know, it, it does, it needs euphemism, it needs exaggeration, it needs to, in order for you to get the critique, it needs to exaggerate these, you know, things through the characters um, and through, through the, the roles that they portray um, in, in the text. Um, but, you know, satire can often also stand alone, whereas parody relies on you having a familiarity with the, you know, the object or subject that's being critiqued. Satire, it doesn't need that necessarily, it doesn't need to have something like that for you to get it. You may not, still may not get it, but it depends again on what you got up here and what you got for tools. Um, often, you know, again, parody is used as a tool here and, and satire is where anger and frustration meets humor. And that's where the real critical effect comes out. And this is like spot on in, in South Park, okay? Um, and again, what this is supposed to do is to challenge, you know, um, the status quo, the normal, what we perceive as normal, and to challenge dominant discourses. Again, think of discourses as like the way that we talk about a person or a thing and how this is created through, you know, um, educational systems, religious systems, family structures, class structures, race structures, media coverage, etc. That all creates discourse. How we talk about, think about how a subject or object is framed is through discourse. And we engage in that and we also perpetuate it, etc. So what is the dominant discourse on what is normal, what is acceptable, etc., etc. is often deconstructed through satire. Now, last class I went through Mikhail Bakhtin's theory of carnivalesque. We'll spend a few minutes touching on this because I, you know, again, just to reiterate the concepts because they become really important um, in what we're going to watch and consume today. So again, you know, uh, Bakhtin, you know, looked at you know pop, uh, excuse me, pop, uh, you know, dominant culture and folk culture and popular culture, etc and looked at this theory of carnivalesque, which basically had three elements, right? And this is one thing we want to look at in every South Park episode that we watch today, right? Um, first off, you know, ritual spectacle, the collapse of hierarchy, undermining authority, undermining politicians, undermining the perceived authority of, of celebrities, um, and inverting and challenging power structures um, through this in Carnival. And again, he was looking at medieval Carnival, where beggars become, you know, um, kings, 
kings and queens and kings and queens become peasants and you know the flattening of of hierarchy etc okay and also within you know carnivalesque is the uh comic ver verbal compositions what do you call them which are parodies again a major element of south park and la one of the uh the third element is genres of billingsgate which was basically playground language and we see this in all episodes of South Park, I mean, we see the, the boys on the playground and we hear them using, you know, basically playground language, uh, using, you know, cusses, slurs, how they talk about other students, how they talk about other things, um, as genres of Billingsgate. And then obviously, lastly, we have shit humor. Ah, you know, uh, scatological humor and the grotesque, right? Um, bodily excess, drinking, puking, shitting, fucking pissing right uh whatever it is you know um is all a major part of the carnival um so you know that that the idea that we all shit um becomes a major part of carnival the queen's shit the king's shit just like us peasants okay and that's very important so we have those four elements ritual spectacle right comic verbal compositions genres of billingsgate and then we obviously end with scatological humor and bodily excess which is a major part of all south park episodes okay so again we want to just remember that you know this was about you know festive laughter um using you know basically shit humor and we want to expand that now i want you to think about this you're sitting at home watching this shit and like Maybe your parents or family members or friends are like, dude, what the fuck? You're in a South Park class. And you're like, yeah, well, I'm learning about scatological humor. What? What is that? You know? Well, shit jokes. The value of shit jokes in, in, in collapsing hierarchy in society. There you go. There, there it is. You've learned something today. Teach, teach the family. Um, you know, but this element of the grotesque body, the incomplete body, the protrusions of the body, the disgustingness of the body itself. And this relies on two elements of humor, the lower body, which deals with fucking, pissing, shitting, farting, uh, drinking, uh, etc. Puking, all that stuff, uh, pot bellies, um, you know, wieners, whatever you want to think of. And then there's an element of the upper body. So it, it doesn't actually have to do with upper and lower body, but you know, we're dealing with humor and wit and intellectualism when we think of the stratum of the upper body versus the lower body, which is just, you know, all the nasty, all the nasty stuff, um, you know. So when we think of the upper body, we can also think of dominant ideologies and discourses um, within within society. Okay, and basically South Park is, as we know, it's carnivalesque on television. Okay, so I have some images of medieval carnival. You can see it popping, and then more, you know, newer images of of, of of other types of carnival. We could think of like you know, like Burning Man, or uh, you know. Um, uh, uh, Mardi Gras, right? Where again, we think drinking, uh, sex, puking, shitting, pissing in the streets, you know, all that stuff. Mardi Gras, right? The the lower body uh, humor on on you know on blast, you know, uh, fully. Uh, then think about music festivals again. Like y'all go to like some of these things, music festivals. Just think about what you do there that you maybe wouldn't do. Uh, an everyday life where, you know, um, you know, how you would expose yourself, how you would, where, you know, would you just go and take a shit over there because you got to take a shit and you're at a music festival and the lines are, are up, you know, 400 people deep to the, you know, the porta potties or, or whatever. And then I have an image of the Eugene Country Fair, which is this crazy hippie fair that's, that's out, out in the woods, uh, and, you know, every year but it's kind of interesting you go there and like you'll see your accountant in a banana hammock and you know your, your college professor with nothing on but painted blue uh you know things you don't want to see but it's it's about that inversion and collapse of, of hierarchy um through celebration through excess through excess consumption uh etc Okay, I talked about the grotesque body, right? Um, again, we think of the openness of the mouth, of the vagina, of the butthole, um, all, all that stuff, uh, ears, 
you know, nose, you know, all the things that come in and go out of those, uh, you know, can go in and come out of those things and how we see that on South Park. And then we also have, you know, the protrusions, the pot bellies, the noses, the penises, the, the breasts, all the excessive protrusions of the bodies, okay? And, you know, when we think of carnival, it's about exposing those things. It's about exposing those things and not judging and not being critical where people can have it all have it all out there and the reason why is that you know for this moment of carnival for these three days or these one days or this day or this night we can just be humans and shit in the streets or in the woods depending on where you're at okay so obviously I gave uh talked about Snooky and Michael Jefferson as an example of the grotesque body, just one of the many, many, many examples, right? And again, this is to undermine their authority as, as uh, public figures and celebrities within society. And then obviously our old boy, Randy. So I kind of went all over this, talked about Caitlyn Jenner, uh, et cetera. So we're gonna watch uh, an episode of South Park um, which you should have actually, actually, you should have watched this before, um, called Cancelled, okay? And uh, this is a classic um, episode of South Park um, that's basically, it was supposed to be the 100th episode, and it gets to the point where, like, again, the guys are like, we're all out of ideas. Um, so they rehash, in a way, the first um, episode of South Park, which is uh, Cartman gets gets an anal probe. Now, I love the scene in this where um, Kyle <laughs> has to put his finger in Cartman's butthole to set off the thing. Me and my son were watching this episode the other day, and <laughs> we were both cracking up. This kid's, you know, not quite three yet, and we were just both cracking up because every time Kyle would go to put his finger near it, and Cartman would fart, <laughs> and it was just so amazing. But here, I mean, think about Carnival I mean, He's got this huge, you know, satellite in his butthole. You know, the farting. You know, I mean, just Cartman himself is a representation of excess with it with his body. Um, but uh, yeah, this is a parody of South Park's first episode. So again, think about intertextuality here, uh, meta-ness, self-reflexiveness of South Park, you know, um, which is super important. It was actually co-written by uh, and with Norman Lear, who wrote a bunch of shows, uh, specifically All in the Family, which really, um, you know, uh, influenced uh, 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 some of the, some of the content and Cartman specifically, but they uh, Norman Lear also also wrote um, the Jeffersons. Uh, he wrote a bunch of other like pretty classic you know '70s uh, sitcoms. Okay, so some elements of uh, of intertextuality that we have in this. Obviously, we have Independence Day. They reference the film Contact. Obviously, with Jeff Goldblum in it. You know, we're getting, we're getting Independence Day. And then they have a, the, a parody of the Dukes of Hazzard chase scene where the aliens are chasing them. And then they parody, in many ways, uh, uh, the aliens, right? Uh, they parody, um, uh, you know, Missy Elliott, fucking Michael Jordan, uh, Mr. Rourke and Tattoo, uh, Frank Sinatra, George Burns, Jimmy Walter, Walker, Dino my, you know, like all that stuff that, you know, they bring in parody elements in that as the aliens trying to take a form, which they settle on a taco that shits. Carnival, right? Shitting. Taco that shits ice cream. Classic. Grotesque fantasy, right? Um, but even think about it more, right? Earth. What is Earth? It is a reality TV show. I've been thinking about that lately with the pandemic and everything that's going on. It's like, when are, they, when are the aliens gonna come and like help us or be like, wow, we, you know, or cancel our asses? I don't fucking know. Maybe this is interesting TV for them, right? But uh, Earth is, you know, a reality TV show by Nerzod Productions, I love it, right? Because of low ratings, it gets canceled or is going to get canceled. So the boys try to try to save it. Now the boys then try to speak to the controllers of all media in the uh, universe, the Jusians, who also, when you talk about the grotesque body, I mean, think about them with you know their big protruding bellies, big noses, and then them you know uh, sucking each other's jagons and you know, putting their fingers in their whatever thrushers or thrash, whatever, right? Again, thinking, you know, about carnival here, you know, 
Um, and obviously this is some sort, you know, commentary on the stereotype that, you know, Jews control all, all the media, um, which, which South Park, you know, often, uh, often goes after and jokes about and hyper stereotypes and, you know, in, in many ways, um, you know, but, uh, you know, they get, they get it. So earth isn't canceled, you know, but I mean, th- think about throughout the whole episode, we think about elements of the carnival and, 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 you know, lower body humor and the upper body stratum. I mean, here's a commentary, you know, on society, on television, all that people want is like, they don't care about like earth's going to be canceled and, you know, done away with. They care about their, them being famous. Right. And like people will sacrifice so much to be famous, which is a major part of of the uh, commentary here, but parody is just such a, such an element, um, you know, of, of this story as well. So to make the overarching satire about what we consume and what we need and what's interesting for us um, on television and how we act, you know, uh, is is rife with all these elements of parody that help to construct this overarching satire. Okay, but again, like. Think about grotesque bodies. Think about the language here. Um, you know, think about the fantasy where the boy, you know, Cartman's got an anal, you know, uh, a satellite that's broadcasting part of Earth to the Fognal network, you know. Um, you know, uh, next Galgamar. <laughs> I love it. Um, but any, anyways, I think, you know, just, you know, just to make this commentary, um, you know, they use so many of these tools that, that we've been talking about in this episode. So anyways, you know, you should have watched it. Maybe go back and think about it a little bit under this context and some of the elements that stuck out to you. Bring it to our happy hour. We're going to take a little bit of a break here um, out here at Goat's Beard Farm and Homestead. I'm out by the barn. It's just a decent day, so I brought out the throne, um, you know, just to spit some fire at y'all. So uh, take care. We'll be back in a few minutes. Have a nice little break and catch you on the flip.